So there's some, there's some VAT myths, uh, and let me talk about some of the biggest ones. The first is that the VAT is not transparent. And this is a real concern, particularly for people who um, uh, are very worried and groups that are very worried about the level of spending. Uh, so there's some groups that are devoted to sort of reducing the amount of uh, taxes collected, and they're very concerned that that is not transparent. They're very concerned that the VAT will be implemented, that no one will have any idea how much they're paying, which will allow Congress to go ahead and to raise more and more revenues, uh, and all of a sudden we look like Sweden. Um, but, and so just to take a quote out of a Heritage Foundation policy brief, uh, the VAT's biggest flaw, biggest flaw, is that unless mandated otherwise, the amount of VAT paid by taxpayers is hidden. And transparency is important, right? So one of the problems with the corporate tax, for example, is that we economists have no idea who pays a corporate tax. Half of economists think it's paid by, uh, ultimately paid by workers. The other half think it's paid by people who own capital. Um, we really, honestly, I've studied this issue a lot. We have no idea who pays it, and that's a problem. If transparency is the biggest reason why we shouldn't have a VAT, it is easily corrected by simply printing the taxes paid at the bottom of the receipt. And in fact, I think the VAT could be the most transparent tax of all. If every time you went ahead and paid the value added tax, you were handed a receipt as a consumer that says exactly how much you paid, that's far more transparent than an income tax, where you only pay once a year, than a corporate tax, you have no idea who's paying it. I mean, imagine if as a worker, every hour you work, someone came and handed you a receipt that said you've just paid $14 in tax. Um, and that's effectively what a VAT does. Every time you purchase uh, something, some countries print the amount paid at the bottom of the receipt, and that's what should happen. So I'm advocating for a VAT with full transparency where every purchase you make, you're told explicitly how much you're paid. This is a very easily addressed criticism, and if this is the biggest reason not to have a VAT, and we can fix it with programming printers, great, easily done. Um, the other myth I talked about this earlier is that a VAT leads to bigger government. And there's just no empirical evidence for this. It's a theory, uh, President Reagan uh, called it the Star of the Beast theory, and the idea is that, look, if you think that government spending is too big, and many people do, then one way to reduce government spending is to sort of induce deficit crises by having not enough revenue to cover that spending, then Congress will be forced to bring that spending down. It's called the Star of the Beast theory. The problem with this theory is that there's just no evidence for it. It makes sense in theory. But when we go and look at the way the governments have behaved, governments tend to either be thrifty or not. That is, they tend to either cut spending and raise taxes, as we saw under the first Bush administration and under the Clinton administration, or they tend to do the opposite. They tend to increase spending and reduce taxes. Um, and so we can look at this over OECD countries, and there's also just not any evidence, as I mentioned earlier, that the VAT is a cause of bigger government. And one thing, and Bruce Bartlett makes this point, is that if you looked at VATs adopted after the 1970s, after these periods of high inflation have, had passed, you tend to see the countries did increase their VAT rates very much. And this is what this table shows. So you can see uh, the various OECD countries that established after 1975, and you can see how much they increased their, their tax rates. Uh, Korea did not increase it between adoption in 1977 and 2009, for example. Um, some countries did increase it. Turkey increased their rate from 10% to 18%, which is a big jump. It almost doubled it. Uh, Japan increased it from 3% to 5%, which is proportionally a very big jump, but is also only a 2 percentage point increase. Some countries decreased it. Canada decreased it. Czech Republic decreased it. On average, uh, the, the, an unweighted average, the initial rate was about 15%, 14.7%. When they adopted it, by 2009, countries had just, uh, on average, increased their rates to 15.6%. But remember that the IMF had found that some of this increase was used to pay for reductions in other taxes. So this isn't all just the difference between the 14.7 the initial rate and the 15.6 initial rate is not just all bigger government. Some of that is a reduction in other tax bases. Uh, there's another myth, and, and so this is now uh, opposition on the left. Uh, the reason that, that, that liberal economists and that liberal groups don't like the VAT is because they, they're concerned that it's strongly regressive. Um, the VAT is regressive, but I think its magnitude is vastly overstated. Um, we talk a lot about incidents 
in tax policy. We care about who pays the taxes. And so liberal groups tend to be concerned that because low-income households save little or no of their income, the percent of income paid in the value-added tax is much higher than a high-income tax, uh, uh, high-income uh, household who might go ahead and save some of their income. And because of that, doesn't charge any tax on saving, that's why economists like it, it tends to be borne more by groups that are at the bottom. And that's true, but the, the magnitude is overstated for, for a few reasons. One, it's not always right to look at the incidence as a cross-section just to take one year. Uh, you, can look, you could look at someone who's 20 years old, not earning a lot of money. Um, maybe they'll be rich in the future, but that person's going to have a high, very high incidence in the year that they have low wages and they're not saving very much. They will relative to their to their uh, time when they're 40 or 50 and they're making much higher wage than they are saving. So the point is that if you look at it over a lifetime, rather than just a snapshot in one year, the incidence of the VAT is much less, much less regressive. So this table shows the rate paid as a share of income. And the decile, the first decile is the poorest 10% of households, the 10th decile is the richest. Uh, and so this economist named Gib Metcalf, uh, who's now at Tufts University but was at Treasury for a few years before that, went ahead and wrote a paper, this was in 1994, and he compared the incidence, if you look at things on a one-year basis versus a lifetime basis, and he found that it's much more equal if you look at it over the, as a lifetime basis uh, than at a one-year basis. So you can see uh, in the first column, looking at a VAT on an annual basis, uh, you see a, a tax rate of about 7.7% relative to income in the first decile, going down to, to a rate of about 2.8% for the richest. If you're implementing a tax, this isn't really what you want, right? You don't want to have the poorest pay a tax rate that's about three times as high as, as the richest. Uh, that generally goes against our notions of, of a fair tax. Um, but if you look at it on a lifetime basis, they're much more equal, and they're much less, uh, less dispersed. The poorest decile is paying 4.3% over the course of their lifetime. The richest is paying just under 3%. That's not so different. An important point, too, when we're talking about regressivity is that just because the VAT is slightly regressive doesn't mean that we can't have a progressive tax system overall. We can have a progressive tax system overall that has a regressive aspect. And so when we talk about maybe introducing a VAT and reducing income taxes, one thing we can do is go ahead and reduce income taxes on middle-income households, where on net, the introduction of a VAT plus reductions in income tax rates could lead to uh, hitting the, the progressivity targets that we want to hit. 